This is the R Podcast, Episode 2, Getting Ready to Use R. podcast. I'm your host Eric Nance. This podcast aims to give users new to statistical computing or who have experience of other statistical computing software valuable and practical information for using R to accomplish innovative data analysis. In episode one I described the history of the R project and gave a brief overview of the features of R. In this episode I will describe how to get ready for using R. Before we get to that, I have a couple updates I'd like to share regarding the site itself. First of which is we are now a podcast available on iTunes as well. And that that update was actually given in a site update about a week ago. And I'm happy to be a part of the iTunes uh, audience as well. So to subscribe to the our podcast using iTunes, the easiest way will be on the home site at www.r-podcast.org. We have a direct link to subscribing using iTunes on the right-hand side under subscription options. And my other update is I am happy to report that the content for the R Podcast will now be aggregated on rbloggers.com. For those of you who have not heard of R Bloggers, this is a very innovative site that's been created by Tao Galili in which many blogs that write about R itself and various ways of using R have submitted to have their content aggregated on that site. And so really this site is kind of like a home base for all the different uh, contributions of the R community who have written blogs about using R. I have been reading this site since really the beginning of its inception and it really got me hooked to what the community is doing with R and really kind of got my creative juices flowing for down the road starting an adventure like this. So I was able to contact Tao and he got me, um, got the R podcast, uh, part of the R bloggers content now. In fact, he passed on some nice encouraging feedback in which he said, I strongly support your project. I was waiting for someone to start this for years now, and I am glad you did it. Your feed will be added now. Good luck and keep in touch, Tao. Well, thank you very much, Tao. And like I said, I am very excited to have the content of the R podcast aggregated into our bloggers. And I'm really excited to perhaps have the increased exposure for the R podcast as our bloggers has developed a very large audience of users around the world who are interested in all things R. Next, I'm happy to say that we have received our first piece of listener feedback. So without further ado, let's get to our listener feedback. Message for you, son. So our first ever feedback to the R podcast comes to us from Gary. Gary writes, I just read your announcement about the R cast on R bloggers. Thanks for doing this. I agree with you that the user community is what makes R so awesome, and you're certainly making a nice contribution with this podcast. Here are a few suggestions that you may or may not find useful. Because you are choosing a podcast format, Rather than a web-based repository or blog, I'm assuming that you want a high level of listener interaction, more of a conversation than an article. This podcast will be more successful if it is released on a regular cycle rather than periodically. Weekly is perfect, even if the episodes are very short, perhaps 10 to 15 minutes, for example. Podcasts require a certain number of repetitions before a stable episode format takes shape and listeners know what to expect. I would also enjoy hearing about some of the great data manipulation functions that are underutilized. 
such as interaction and even cut. One thing that annoys me daily is the difficult difficulty of creating tables of simple counts and percents, so much so that I just write my own good enough functions to make them or use ddply with dot fun equals summarize to get what I need. R really needs a better tables function like SPSS custom tables. And yes, I've tried everything I could find on CRAN. If I ever get good enough to make this package myself, I will. Best, Gary. Well, thank you very much, Gary. You are correct in that my hopes of doing this podcast is to have a high level of interaction with listeners and help them see how innovative and powerful R is for data analysis. I also agree with your point about a regular release cycle. I have seen how podcasts I listen to have become successful due to a consistent format, interaction with their audience, and at regular release cycles. As I continue to produce additional episodes, I plan to stick to a regular release cycle, and I'm still kind of evaluating what would be the best cycle at this time. You brought up some excellent points about data manipulation functions. I plan to talk about data processing and manipulation in a future episode, and I'll keep those functions you mentioned in mind. I use functions like ddply and related functions from the plier package regularly when I need to summarize a data set with many groups. And I've been looking for packages that can make informative and easy to read tabular summaries as well. There is a package I've started to use called report tools, which has some nice summaries for qualitative and quantitative variables, so that might be worth checking out if you haven't already. But thanks again, Gary. I really appreciate the feedback. Now it is time for the main topic of today's episode, getting ready to use R. So the first part of this topic, I'll give some instructions for how to install R. The good news is that the installation process is quite easy for each of the platforms. So first, let's discuss where you can go to download R. As I mentioned in the first episode, the home base for everything R is located at r-project.org. When you access that site, you'll see a page um, that has a lot of information on the left side, a few links, and the one link you'll be interested in is under the download packages area and that link is called CRAN and this CRAN stands for the Comprehensive R Archive Network. Go ahead and click that link and then you'll be taken to a page that has a list of different what are called mirror sites around the world that host all the content for the the R software packages and also R itself. You'll see that it's quite an international list, which again speaks to the international nature of R itself. So the best practice is to find one of these mirror sites that is closest to your geographic location because this will result in the optimal download speed for R itself and any of the packages you would choose to install. So for the purposes of today's episode, since I'm located in the United States, let's say I choose the mirror that's associated with Iowa State University, and that's if you scroll towards the bottom of the page, and I believe it's the third one in the USA set of mirrors. Once you click that, you'll be taken to a page where it has a box at the top where it says download and install R. And what these are, are the pre-compiled binary distributions of R itself, and those are really the easiest way to install R on each of the platforms. You'll see that there are separate links for the Linux, Mac OS X, and Windows versions of R. Let's go ahead and start with the Windows version. Go ahead and click the Download R for Windows link, and then you'll be taken to a page that has R for Windows at the top. You'll see a few links on the left side under the heading subdirectories. What you'll be interested in is clicking on the base link because this will have what you'll need and when you want to install R for the first time. 
So let's say we've clicked that base link. Now you'll be taken to the page where you can actually install or download R itself. At the time of this recording, the latest version of R is R.2.14.1. You'll see at the very top, a link that says download R 2.14.1 for Windows. Go ahead and click that link and this will actually download the executable installer file and once you download that actually the installation of R itself on Windows is fairly straightforward. You'll see that there are a few options that if you want to customize the installation you can but for most users accepting the defaults will be just fine. Next, let's say you're running Mac OS X in one of its variants and you'd like to install R for that. So going back to the page where we are at where we're able to choose which version of R we want to install, go ahead and click the R for Mac OS X link. Here you'll see a link, a link to various uh, files. The one you'll be interested in is the R 2.14.1.pkg file. Once you click that link, then you'll want to click the tools link toward the bottom as well because those will give you some necessary uh, libraries for building packages and using what's called the TCLTK package as well. Now I personally don't have a lot of experience of using R on the Mac software but I know quite a few people who do and they said that the installer file is fairly straightforward and like the Windows version most users will be able to accept the defaults without a problem. Lastly let's talk about the Linux installation. You'll notice that there are a few different Linux uh, distributions offered when you click the link called Linux back in that version page that we talked about before. You'll see that there are four of them in particular there is Debian, Red Hat, SUSE, and Ubuntu. For my personal use, I have used R on the Ubuntu flavor distributions. Therefore, let's say you're, you're running Ubuntu or a similar software as well. Go ahead and click the Ubuntu link. You'll be taken to a page that has some very nice information for installing R. Now, some of you may know that actually R is going to be available in your distributions package manager already without having to go to the R page. But there's one caveat with that in that the version of R that's available in your Linux distribution might be out of date by the time you actually get to installing R because that version was chosen at the time the distribution was in essence made. So for me, I like to be up to date with the latest version and that's why I go to this site that I've talked about for installing R. The way the installation goes for the Linux or Ubuntu platform is you can add a custom entry to your software sources which will then pull the latest version of R and then one thing to keep in mind is once you add that software source you'll want to run an update to your list of packages and from that then you can use say the Synaptic Package Manager or even from the command line you want to install the package called R-Base and this will give you the basic installation of R. Now for those of you like I said that are using R on Linux you'll want to also install a package called R-Base.dev as well because that will contain some necessary libraries that will be used for actually installing the other add-on packages. Linux does the installation of packages within R slightly differently in, in that the packages are installed from their associated source files and not specific binaries like they are for the Windows and Mac platforms. Therefore, whenever I install R on a new Linux distribution, in this case let's say an Ubuntu distribution, I make sure to pick up the R-Base-Dev package as well. But once that's done, then you'll be able to have R up and running on your distribution. And for the record, I'm actually using another distribution called Linux Mint 
which actually is a derivative of Ubuntu. So for those of you that may be using Linux Mint, go ahead and click on the Ubuntu link for when you want to get the right source for installing R. And from what I've heard, the installation for the other Linux platforms is fairly straightforward as well. But since I primarily use the Ubuntu and Linux Mint distributions, I won't cover the rest of those for this podcast. So once you have R installed, you can execute R in the following ways, depending on your platform. For the Windows platform, there will likely be a desktop shortcut that links to R itself, or it's also found in the Start menu, and just go ahead and search for R. And then choosing that, or launching that, you'll be you'll get brought up this um, R GUI, which comes with the installation of R for Windows. We'll get to that in a little bit. For the Mac platform, there is also a launcher for R installed, and I believe it's in the same place as the typical launchers for software as well. Once you launch that, then the Mac version also contains an R GUI as well. Lastly, for Linux, well, the bad news is there is no GUI or graphical user interface associated with the Linux version, and in order to run R, you would just type capital R at a terminal or command input, and then you'll be, you'll be taken to the console of R itself. So let's take a step back and talk about these GUIs for the Windows and Mac versions of R. So each of them will offer some menus for, say, installing and loading those add-on packages. When you make graphs, there is a menu for exporting plots to different types of files. And there are some menus for accessing the built-in R help system, among other features as well. Now, of the two, the Mac R GUI does contain some other useful features that are nice for writing code, such as giving function arguments, as you type in a function name and then at the bottom of the R GUI, you'll kind of see those arguments spelled out at the bottom in case you forgot maybe what a certain function's arguments are. Now, unfortunately, like I said, for the Linux platform, all you have is the R command line interface, which admittedly can be difficult for new users right off the bat. So next I'd like to talk about a step that is entirely optional for running R, but it can greatly help in both learning the way R works as well as optimizing your R code development. And that is the installation of an R IDE, or Integrated Development Environment. The IDEs for R offer many additional features that make developing R code a lot easier, some of which include syntax highlighting for the various uh, words in your R code. So you may see different highlighting for like function names versus variables and things of that nature. Also, they include some very nice keyboard shortcuts that can be customized as well for running code from, say, the files you create that have R commands and also for navigating to different files. It'll also have the ability to let you see your code file. Sometimes those are called scripts, but they're basically, like I said, a text file that has a series of R commands, and the R console in the same actual window or interface. And also, they offer an easier navigation of the R help system, and in some cases, able to directly search the help files of R and the associated packages. So the good news is there are many IDEs available for R. Some of them are platform specific and others are cross-platform, just like R itself. To give an overview of each of the IDEs would be more than enough content for an entire episode. But the first question some of you may have is which one is the best? Well, ultimately, it is a matter of preference, as I think it highly depends on the features you are looking for. As for me, I look for the following features. I look for A, that it is cross-platform. The reason for that is I tend to use R on different platforms, sometimes alternating between the Windows version and the Linux version, or depending on what environment I'm currently running. 
Next, I like to have very easy to use object browsing. Now, we haven't talked about objects in R yet, but that will be probably the topic for the next episode. And I really like to have an ID that can easily show me what objects are currently in my environment or my workspace. That's another definition we'll, we'll flesh out next episode. So that I can quickly see what's, what's available and then quickly browse to those. Next, I like to have fast and easy searching of our help in add-on packages. I also like to have automatic recording of both code history and also plot history. Lastly, I like to have a tabbed interface for multiple R script files. That's kind of like when we use internet browsers these days. Now all of them tend to offer tab browsing, so you don't always have to have multiple windows open, but you can have, say, one browser window open and have multiple tabs inside. So with all that said, I have used a few IDEs that satisfy at least most of the criteria I just described. These include Emacs plus the ESS plugin, Eclipse plus the StatET plugin, and RStudio. All of these are very excellent IDEs, and really, depending on your preferences, any of these could be right for you. I know a lot of programmers out there that have built their skills using, say, the Emacs platform, so when they find out that they can use R directly from a win Emacs via the ESS plugin, that's, that's it for them. They, they really like that feature because they're already used to that development environment. Likewise, for the Eclipse environment, Eclipse is a IDE that's used for a lot of programming development, such as, say, Java, C++, even LaTeX, a bunch of other programming languages. And so if a user has already experienced with that, and then they want to learn R, naturally, that may be the place for them to go. Right now, for me personally, I am actually using the RStudio IDE for most of my development. There are many unique features for RStudio that make the experience of developing R code a lot easier. Some of the things I like the most are the easy navigation of add-on packages that are currently installed, as well as actually installing additional packages. There is also nice search boxes for searching both the package help and the functions help. What's a newer feature is the integration of version, version control systems like Git and Subversion for creating your code files. And that's something that we are definitely going to talk about in future episodes because in today's uh, technology that we have available, I think having version control of any of our analysis routines that have been already available for many years for software development is a very nice feature to have for actually statistical analysis and developing your programming associated with that. I also like one of the newer features in which it allows for creating separate projects for different sets of code and other files. And this is perfect for when you have a situation of say you're analyzing one particular data set or a set of related data sets you can unify all the code you create for that analysis, maybe any graphs you have for that, etc., and it will be in this one integrated project separate from others. And what's really interesting, and this has been available since its inception, is the availability of not only the standard desktop version for our studio, which for most users will be just fine, but there is also a server version of our studio. And what's really useful about that is that that allows, when, to, when RStudio server is installed on a server, that allows you to actually run RStudio and hence R itself via a web browser on a different computer that doesn't have to have R on at all. So that is really nice to have. And I've been using that actually in my setup here at home where I have a server that actually acts as like a multimedia server in which it's running 24-7, but it's got enough power to really host a nice installation of R. And once I put the RStudio server on that, I can then, no matter whatever computer I'm using in my house, 
I can just go ahead and browse to the RStudio web page for that server version, and then I can just run R just from a simple web browser. To me, that's just a really nice feature, and I'm really glad the developers of RStudio put that in. So not one last thing to touch on is that unlike some of the other IDEs out there, once RStudio is installed, it requires little to no configuration to actually get it up and running and to let it talk with R itself. So really, I, in my opinion, the RStudio IDE has really become a very nice set, has a very nice set of features and has made my code development a lot easier. And I've heard great things for those that are new to R about using RStudio to help get up to speed with R itself. So definitely check out their site called rstudio.org and you'll find information on how to download RStudio and as well as some very helpful documentation they have put together for actually running RStudio itself. So the last thing I wanted to touch on for this episode is I'd like to highlight some of the resources online that have proven to be very valuable for not only learning R, but also for getting help and finding additional resources. If you go to our home site at r-podcast.org, click on the R Resources tab at the top. You'll see that I have different categories of resources, and in particular, check out the Online References and Tutorials section. The first is RSeq, which is in essence the Google for anything related to R. In fact, it's a customized Google search engine that makes finding content related to R itself a lot easier than actually trying to find the R-related content on the Google's main search page itself. I had the remaining links in that section are some very nice tutorials that have some great examples of the different concepts that we are going to discuss in future episodes of the podcast, especially when talking about the basics of R itself and then getting to some more advanced topics. So I hope this has given you a nice overview of the installation of R itself, which is very easy, and then also thoughts on choosing the right integrated development environment for your learning of R itself and getting to develop R code. I'll have links for the available IDEs that I mentioned, among others, in the show notes for this episode. So with that, I think it's time to wrap things up. So thanks again for tuning in to the second episode of the R Podcast. I hope that you stay subscribed to the show via iTunes or our RSS feed in your favorite podcast aggregating software. Like I said, we're very happy to have our content on our bloggers now, and I wanted to thank Tal again for getting us on the site itself. In our next episode, we'll start talking about some of the basics of R itself. We're going to talk about what these different types of objects are to really start setting the foundation for how R works with data analysis. So thanks again for tuning in, and until next time, end of line.